Thank you for watching ECSO News on Blab TV, where facts matter. I'm Amber Southerd. And I'm Allison Morgan. Well, this is how you don't want to start your honeymoon. On March 12th, the newlywed couple entered their beach rental and found a man standing in their master bedroom. The couple thought the suspect had left the house and drove away in a vehicle. But when ECSO deputies arrived, they began searching the home with a canine. That's when they heard the newlywed wife yell, It's the male! Standing in the backyard was Donald Belcher. He was arrested and charged with burglary of an unoccupied dwelling, grand theft, criminal mischief, and trespassing. Also arrested was Belcher's boyfriend, Jonathan Bariga, who entered the home early that night. Bariga was charged with burglary of an unoccupied dwelling, grand theft, and criminal mischief. And a shots fire disturbance at a local park had some people worried. On March 12th, deputies responded to Bristol Park after dispatch received calls from citizens, saying they heard gunshots in the area. Once on scene, deputies found Jaquavia Savage matching the description given by witnesses. Savage began to walk away. That's when deputies saw Savage toss a gun over the fence. A 9mm handgun and a loaded magazine were found on the other side of the fence. Savage was arrested and charged with possession of a concealed firearm, possession of a firearm by a minor, and possession of marijuana less than 20 grams. On January 9th, the Scambia County Sheriff's Office investigators were notified about a sexual abuse case of a child under 12. Charles Hoyt McConnell III was arrested for sexual assault, incest, cruelty towards a child, direct sexual performance by a child, and 18 counts of possession of child pornography. During the investigation, deputies found out McConnell was using the Kick app to share a pornographic video of the sexual abuse. ECSO investigators partnered with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's Homeland Security Investigations and were able to arrest an Escambia County resident and a suspect from Santa Rosa County. Jonah Othment was arrested in Escambia County after it was discovered the illegal pornographic video was shared with Othment. He was charged with cruelty towards a child, promote sexual performance by a child, and obscene communication computer solicitation on March 7th. The U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement's Homeland Security Investigations arrested Santa Rosa County resident Danny Murphy on March 10th. No more arrests are expected in this case. And we need your help locating an aggravated battery suspect. If you recognize this man or this vehicle, a 2006 Kia Rio, please call the Escambia County Sheriff's Office now. The person pictured is a suspect in an aggravated battery incident that happened on March 1st at the Raceway on Airport Boulevard. If you have any information, you can call the ECSO at 436-9620. And do you know this man? On December 22nd, a person was shot at College Trace Apartments, and now ECSO investigators are looking for this man in this surveillance video. It is believed he may be involved in that shooting. If you have any information about this shooting, contact Crime Stoppers at 433-STOP or the ECSO at 436-9620. The next ECSO Operation Clean Sweep will be in the Bayou Davenport area next week. The ECSO will be in the neighborhood on Thursday, March 23rd. If you would like to help us clean up the area, meet us at Morrington Presbyterian Church at 8 a.m. That's on South Navy Boulevard. And do you want to be part of our Mounted Posse? The Escambia County Mounted Posse is a volunteer unit with each member owning or having access to a horse. Posse members support the Sheriff's Office on missions such as the monthly clean sweep and attend numerous meet and greet events, parades, and fun demonstrations at schools. If you are interested in joining, go to their Facebook page at facebook.com slash ECSO Posse or call Deputy Anderson at 393-2276 for more information. We need your help locating the people in this week's Missing Persons segment. 47-year-old Stephanie Leah Lowen was reported missing on March 9th. It's unknown what she was last seen wearing. And 17-year-old Kyra Lynn Petroni was reported missing on March 8th and is considered a habitual runaway. And help us locate this habitual runaway, Raymond Demarcus Durant. He was reported missing on March 6th and was last seen wearing a white t-shirt and black shoes. If you have any information on these missing people highlighted in tonight's episode, contact the Escambia County Sheriff's Office at 436-9620. 
Congratulations to four of our own on their promotions. Meet Lieutenant Nelson, Sergeant Von Ansbach Young, Sergeant Fry Jehovowitz Jr., and Sergeant Taylor. They received their promotions from Sheriff Morgan last week. They will be formally honored at our award ceremony next week. And we would like to welcome a new member to the ECSO Extended Family. Check out this picture of Canine Axel welcoming his new little brother, Philip Tate Rogers. Thanks to Deputy Rogers and his family for sharing these moments with us. Each week on ECSO News, we have Crime Stoppers Coordinator Melanie Peterson. Deputy Peterson is on to talk about our wanted fugitives. She's with Crime Stoppers. Yeah, well, our three wanted fugitives of the week, we want to focus on uh, three individuals wanted for escape. And this is okay. escape from work release program, which is really makes no sense to me because they finally get an opportunity to not only keep their employment, right. um, but not be incarcerated in the county jail. Yeah. And, uh, but all three individuals are wanted um, as of March the 13th, uh, 2017, and they all have so no very bonds. Very recent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's see who we have. Uh, we have Brandon Egerton. Uh, Brandon is 34 years old, and again, he is wanted for escape on a no bond. Uh, we also have Christopher Boyington, who is wanted, um, again, as of March 13th, uh, 28 years old, no bond for escape. And Edna Turner. Edna is 32 years of age, and she's also wanted. And they, and they were all escaped from, like, the work release. So they just basically went to work and decided not to go back. Wow. No. Yeah, you would think, you know, having this opportunity to have work and be out of jail that they would want to continue that life. But Absolutely. And for those of you that know their whereabouts or their locations, we ask that you please contact Crime Stoppers at 433-STOP. We have recently changed uh, software. Okay. We are now going through the um, P3 program, which is uh, way more convenient. Um, for those of you that would like to pro post a web tip, uh, go to p3.com and it'll walk you right through. It's also available on Android and iOS devices. Okay, great. And there are a couple other ways that they can um, turn in a fugitive as well. Well, right? the changeover has um, replaced the Texas tip. Um, okay. They can, any of those who, uh, in, anybody out there that has an iOS or an Android device, can go through the P3 app on your, your cell phone and uh, communicate with Crime Stoppers there. The call center is still available 24-7. Perfect. So. And um, what do they need to do to remain anonymous? Uh, call Crime Stoppers. Never give your name. We won't ask. You don't give your name. Uh, keep that Crime Stopper number that they give you, the tip number. Uh, contact uh, me on Mondays between 9 a.m. or 1 p.m. or go online and check the status of your tip. P3 enables them to do that um, at their leisure now. So they'll be able to actually check the status of their tip 24-7. And if they want another look at these three people, what's a good way um, for them to get another look? Absolutely. You can also, um, not only the Sheriff's Office page, but you can go directly to the Crime Stoppers Facebook page. Um, they're posted on the kiosk around town, as well as uh, they'll be featured on Blab TV, one of fugitives on Sunday. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Deputy thank Peterson, you. for joining us. Well, we decided to bring Investigator Godwin on with us again to talk about property crimes and things you can do to protect yourself. Thank you for joining us. No problem. Yeah. Nice to be here. So we're talking about skimmers, and can you kind of explain to us what, what a skimmer is? Scammers are electronic devices and they're basically used to read people's debit cards and credit cards mainly. Okay. So what do, what do the criminals do? They just put them on like at gas pumps or ATMs or? Correct. What they'll do is uh, the little place you slide your credit card in and out, they'll have a device that usually goes over that and basically what it does is when you run your credit card through there, it reads all the information off the magnetic strip on the back of it. So now they have your identity? Now they have your identity. The only drawback to that is with the skimmer is it does get the information, but it doesn't get your your PIN or your password. So usually there's another device attached somewhere um, that's actually a, a mini camera that's looking to see what you punch in your uh, PIN number, and then they can match that up with the data. Uh, do we see these here in Escambia County? Yes, um, we don't see them um, a whole lot like some of the bigger cities, but we have uh, had several in the last year, and it's like anything else. So, uh, when they find out that it, it can be done and it's easy money, it, it tends to, to grow. So, yeah, they're out there. What's something I can do to protect myself from becoming a victim? Um, mainly when you walk up to somewhere, instead of just putting your card in, you know, look at it. Um, a lot of these are, um, they kind of protrude out normal, 
more than the, the it would normally. Um, they're kind of a homemade looking. And if you, you don't know, you can, you can actually reach up there and kind of wiggle it. So if there's a lot of play and it doesn't look like it's something that's built into the system, then you need to contact um, you know, either the, the gas station or go inside the bank and let them know. And they can come out and, and decide whether that's part of the machine or not. Uh, probably a better way to protect yourself is just to not use those machines. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's, um, it's a convenience thing. Um, and, you know, the other part of that of, of with the PIN number is that when you go up to punch your PIN in, um, kind of look around, you know, even you, you know, even cover the PIN up while you punch it in because they do have to have that PIN code to use your information. It's just another way criminals are getting a, a little smarter uh, with that. Is there anything else people can do or they need to know about them? No, like I said, just look around. The ones that we have seen here mostly um, are kind of uh, crude in style. Um, once you look at it, you notice that something's not right. If something doesn't appear right, like I said, contact the, the bank or go inside the gas station and let them come out and look. Or even at a, um, as a gas station, walk over to the next pump and look and see, does it look like that one there? Um, and like I said, just you know, watch your surroundings and if you can, cover your, your pin code up. Yeah. Another thing is, is people leave their doors unlocked too while they're at that gas pump right. sometimes. We have had uh, some instances, and it's, it's a nationwide thing, where somebody be pumping gas and they're actually coming in through either the window on the other side of the car mm -hmm. or opening the door to the car on the other side and reaching in and stealing purses or wallets or that's just sitting in the seat, you know, while you're watching pumping, pumping gas. It's just so much you have to be aware <laughs> of to do one thing. Just be, you know, yeah. You know, be aware of your surroundings. You know, um, instead of just looking at the gas pump, you know, every once in a while, look around. Um, lock your doors. Lock your doors. Lock your doors. <laughs> Can't say it enough. Correct. Lock your doors. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really no appreciate problem. it. Anytime. And if for any more safety tips, you can always contact us here at the Sheriff's Office at 436-9630. Or if you think you might be a victim of one of these crimes, please, again, call 436-9630. I'm Escambia County Sheriff David Morgan and thank you for watching Ask the Sheriff. This is your chance to ask me any questions you want answered about the ECSO. Our team hits the streets again and here are some of the questions you asked. The question is, I'd like to know how the Sheriff believes that medical marijuana will affect uh, Escambia County. Jenna asked, how do I uh, feel or believe that medical marijuana uh, will affect Escambia County? Well, Jenna, quite obviously it'll affect the state of Florida and not just Escambia County. Uh, but to be specific, uh, I've always taken the position on medical marijuana uh, that, uh, and by the way, this is a little bit, uh, you know, I will tell you up front that I'm breaking some, uh, somewhat with other uh, law enforcement agency heads and professionals. I'm not qualified enough to in any way engage with the medical profession uh, to dictate to them uh, what they should and should not prescribe uh, for medications uh, for their patients. Uh, you know, I would not be so presumptuous as to lecture a doctor uh, on medications, uh, any new medication or old medication for that matter. Uh, Marinol uh, has been around for a very, very long time, late 60s, early 70s, uh, which can be taken in a pill or a patch form, uh, which is, uh, you know, again, medical THC, which is the content uh, in marijuana. It's a very low uh, amount that is there, and it's been available for prescription for some time, uh, but again in very limited cases. Uh, I think what you're going to see here and what we fear in law enforcement is that the passage of medical marijuana is just step one to the final legalization of marijuana. Uh, study after study has proven that you know marijuana used in the forms that you see on the street because the THC content is extremely high. A lot of people my age and older uh, you know, don't understand that uh, the THC content in today's marijuana is nothing like the marijuana they smoked back in the in the 60s when marijuana was, you know, the drug of choice and it was a, a craze. And this is where all of the, uh, you know, folks that are, are banging the drum for legalization across the board talk about, you know, it's no worse than alcohol, etc. You know, I don't engage in those circular debates. I normally, uh, as I'm doing uh, with answering your question, is go back to the data that I am familiar with that I have read. So medical marijuana, uh, again, I won't debate that. I think that's left up to the medical profession. Uh, I know I find it a little disconcerting uh, that the American Medical Association, the American Ophthalmolic Association, 
And many of those who were brought into this debate will tell you that there's little or no available data to show uh, you know, the, the efficacy of actually prescribing these drugs. So, uh, but again, I, that's the medical profession, and, and if they're having issue with that, uh, then they won't prescribe it. And, and I, you know, pretty much leave it at that. My concern for marijuana across the board is its eventual, you know, legalization. Uh, I would tell folks to check some of the data coming out of Colorado and some of the states that have basically legalized marijuana, and they have some huge social issues right now. Uh, it's much like gambling. Uh, there are folks who will benefit tremendously from the legalization of, of gambling, uh, drugs, etc. And society as a whole suffers for it because, you know, who pays uh, for dr the drug addiction that's rampant? Who pays for the loss of jobs, etc. in the community when gambling comes in and it sucks the life out of your community where all of the other businesses, except for the large casino complexes, go out of business? You know, the local hoteliers, the mom and pop restaurants and those sorts of things. If you don't work for the large casino, you don't work. And so that's something as a society we need to look at. My approach is I, I enforce laws, I don't make laws. And so if my community decides to legalize marijuana, I'll do the best that I can uh, to enforce the laws such as they are. Same goes with gambling. My personal preference as to whether I agree or disagree uh, with either one of those things uh, really doesn't matter in this debate. You know, the, the day that I come to work and decide I'm going to enforce the laws that I agree with and not the ones that I don't is the day I shouldn't be sheriff. And I was just wondering what a victim advocate does. Emily asked the question, what does a victim advocate do? We have a victim's uh, advocate office here in uh, the Escambia County Sheriff's Office, and they're called in to assist the victims of crimes. Uh, they do everything from, uh, you know, assisting in, in the counseling of, of someone. If, let's say there's a, a death, uh, they're aggrieved. They also walk you through the legal process as to, you know, what uh, avenues do you have as a victim of a crime uh, to, you know, seek restitution from, uh, uh, you know, the individual that committed the crime or state. Uh, and also they're there again as just someone to lean on, uh, you know, to help you through a very difficult time. If it involves a loss of life, of course, there's a grieving process that goes on. And the victim's advocate is there to almost act like uh, a guardian ad litem does for a child, uh, meaning that we're going to be there. We know that at the moment that, uh, you know, your anxiety level is so high uh, that you're not thinking clearly. And so the victim uh, advocate is there just as their name implies. They're to advocate for you uh, to make sure that everything is, is basically prearranged and they step you through the legal process. Because the last thing you need to be dealing with if you're a victim of a crime is all the legalities that are thrown at you. You know, what does that phrase mean? What, you know, do I have to talk to law enforcement? To, uh, you know, does someone, do I need a rights advisement? Do I need this? Victims advocates are there to step you through that process, get you the help that you need, and it's a service that's provided uh, by the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. What is your opinion about uh, the universities allowing their students to carry guns on campus? Frederick asked the question about uh, my uh, opinion or position on guns on campus. Uh, you know, Frederick, that's a really difficult question, and the, the reason why I say that is this. Uh, being a strong gun advocate, I'm aware uh, of the necessity. You know, a bad guy with a gun is always stopped by whom? A good guy with a gun. Uh, you know, for us to have gun-free zones uh, anywhere, not just on campuses, uh, but anywhere, you know, if you have a private business and you post signs out front that, uh, you know, you're prohibited from carrying a firearm on this property, then you've just made a target rich environment for someone who has a gun. Because if I can find a way to get into your business or into your building with a gun, then I'm basically in charge because no one else has a gun. And so you've basically placed innocent civilians at risk by making that very public statement that there are no firearms here. And I would remind everyone that the people that you're dealing with, the criminals, don't follow laws. That's why we call them criminals, is because you can set any rule up you would like, and you know, we need to ask ourselves, how effective are they? And the answer is none. You know, we have this misconception in society today that if we pass a law, it solves a problem. A law is for the lawless, and it only has an effect if we have the will as a society and as a government to enforce those laws and see them to their logical conclusion. Uh, you know, if all it took was a law to end crime, then we wouldn't have any homicides. You know, we have laws against murder today, but people still kill other people. 
we have laws against illegal drug usage, but we still have illegal drug use. And you can go down the whole list of all the laws that we have. They're passed in an attempt to regulate society. You know, what is an acceptable parameter in society for acceptable behavior where we can all live together reasonably peaceable? And so with guns on campus, uh, I will tell you that, uh, you know, uh, when I'm uh, no longer the sheriff of Escambia County, uh, you know, the idea of entering any place where I can't defend myself with a mad person with a gun, whether it's a man or a woman, you know, frightens me to death. Uh, why? Because, again, I'm a law-abiding citizen and I'll leave my gun, you know, secured in the trunk of my car or in my home and I go to a gun-free zone and then someone shows up with a gun who, again, has a total disregard for the law and a disregard for everyone else's life but their own. Then you've placed me and my family and my friends uh, at a tremendous risk. I know that now that a lot of the university officials are saying, uh, you know, because of the college uh, fraternities and sororities and the drinking and, the, and probably drug usage that goes on, I'm sure they wouldn't want to admit to that, uh, that adding, you know, weapons to the mix is something that, uh, you know, they do not need. Of that, I would agree. But I would also say that if that's, if that's your only concern about that, uh, there's a whole host of things that you need to look at. I've not been drawn into that debate. I've not been asked to sit on any panels. Uh, at the local or state level uh, to debate those issues, but I know the university system across the board, I think, uh, uh, you know, doesn't support that, uh, but I think it's an issue that needs to be looked at. Uh, you know, that's kind of my position is, you know, I don't like gun-free zones uh, because they're, they're target-rich environments for criminals. Catherine asked a question about uh, our preferences and hiring practices uh, and the amount of experience someone would bring to the table. Uh, Catherine, it really depends upon the applicant. Uh, the good thing about hiring someone with a law enforcement background, uh, meaning you've worked in corrections or you've worked in law enforcement or probation and parole, uh, and also if you're a former veteran, uh, what you bring to the table in that instance is a work ethic and in all of those jobs that I just mentioned you also have to go through a background check uh, so when you apply, we know that you're bringing those two things to the table, meaning that you're most likely, uh, unless you've been involved in something very recently, uh, will have no issue with the background check, getting through the, uh, you know, the drug testing and, and the polygraph, etc. Uh, also, you know what it is to work shift work, because everyone that comes to law enforcement, uh, you know, we have a day swing and mid shift. We're on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days a year, of course, uh, and so you know you're kind of acclimated, if you will, to that sort of work schedule. So you bring a very strict work regimen to us, and so those are positive things when we go into the hiring process. However, uh, does that mean that an applicant with no experience is automatically excluded? Well, of course the answer is no, because the vast number of our applicants uh, come to us meeting the minimum requirements, meaning they're 21, they can pass the background checks, etc. they have a high school education, etc. And so almost all of our applicants are taken from that pool. So again, uh, would it be a bonus or, or an added benefit for you to have that uh, first background experience uh, that we uh, spoke of? Of course it would. Uh, but again, does it mean you're automatically going to be hired? And the answer is no. Uh, so again, we encourage everyone that meets our minimum standards uh, to please come to the Sheriff's Office and make application because uh, we're almost always hiring at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. So Jonah asked, you know, why are you so passionate or passionate about being Sheriff? Uh, Jonah always wanted to go into law enforcement from the time I was a very young man. Uh, couldn't become a law enforcement officer. I graduated high school when I was 17. So the way I could get into law enforcement very quickly was to join the military because there wasn't an age requirement, if you will. If you were old enough to be in the military, you can serve in any capacity. And so I entered the United States Air Force, became a security police officer, did my first tour of duty, enlisted, and then went back to college and got a, a commission through uh, AFROTC and finished my career as a commissioned officer, uh, both in security police and for a very short while with a group called the Office of Special Investigation. It's kind of the FBI of the Air Force, if you will. So I'm passionate about being sheriff because I'm always looking for ways for us to upgrade and professionalize law enforcement in our community. And it's such a dynamic field. Uh, if you followed law enforcement, especially in the last year or two, uh, we have something you know called the Ferguson effect, which is of course the an outgrowth or or a fallout, if you will, is probably more an appropriate statement uh, of the incidents that occurred uh, in Ferguson, Missouri. 
So how do we react to that to our community uh, where we have things being said about law enforcement that were proved to be patently false, but sadly have taken root and, and caught fire, if you will, th throughout our community, you know, the hands up, don't shoot, which never occurred. So as a chief executive of a law enforcement agency, I have to find ways from a strategic level to respond to those problems in our community and in communities across the United States and do it again appropriately and professionally and again to where we don't worsen a condition or make a condition worse than it currently is. So I find that to be you know, very interesting and I am passionate about that. Why? Because literally if I'm not on my game and I haven't selected the right people to serve in positions in this organization uh, that we don't have supervisors that, that are appropriately trained and supervised, any community can be a flashpoint. And so why, would, why am I passionate about being sheriff? It's because one of my biggest jobs today is to ensure that we keep pace with the changing society and culture and how do we respond to that uh, appropriately in our community with an understanding that we're peacekeepers and we're bringers of the law and that's what we're charged with doing. And so you know, I find that to be you know, immensely interesting. We've got some things coming in the pike here in the next probably decade you know, legalization of drugs that I grew up with uh, that were clearly illegal. Uh, you know, I think while I don't, you know, necessarily agree with some of these changes, part of my job is to, again, determine how we operate within that environment. The legalization of marijuana is an excellent example. That's probably just on the horizon. So how do I, you know, operate in, a, in an environment where I have officers that are prescribed marijuana? I mean, a kind of unique uh, perspective to take, isn't it? Uh, as far as, again, as a sheriff, now I have to deal with the fact that I have an officer being prescribed and taking a narcotic that not that many years ago we were arresting people for. So that's one of the unique, uh, you know, natures and, and items that we have to deal with in law enforcement. And if you're not passionate about, you know, going after those issues and problems, you're probably in the wrong line of work. So great question, and, and I appreciate you asking that. And, uh, you know, I always tell folks, you know, the day that I wake up that I don't look forward to coming to the office and facing all of these challenges, making a better working environment for the men and women at the Escambi County Sheriff's Office is the day I probably need to go. That day's not here yet. So thank you very much for the question. Remember, you can also email your questions and ask the sheriff at escambiaso.com.